Hi again, everyone. Um, so let me start. This, this won't be news to, uh, to either of you, and it is not unique to Chicago. Uh, but we know that, that here, the death rates from asthma are four to six times higher for African Americans and Hispanics, although it differs among different Hispanic uh, communities, than for the city's white residents. Let me just start with a basic threshold question. How do we get to a point of a disparity that big? Gucci? Yeah, so that's very concerning, and we see this nationally, and we definitely see it locally. Um, the disparities, you know, it's partially genetic, right? African Americans and certain Hispanic groups have higher rates of asthma in general, but there is a, a link to poverty and the neighborhood you live in and environmental factors that really plays true, especially in Chicago. Kim, you have worked in Little Village for years, and you have lived there uh, your whole life. When you look at the prevalence of asthma in your community, do you see it as a discrete problem with a discrete set of solutions, or do you see it as a component of a larger set of challenges? I think it's definitely a, comp a, a set of larger challenges. I think the reality is, is our neighborhood is not um, isolated. There are many neighborhoods like ours who are dealing with pollution, genetics, land use decisions that are all impacting the air we breathe both indoor and out. Yeah. So, Rishi, you you've done some pretty detailed, uh, almost anthropological, you know, studies of neighborhood by neighborhood rates yes. uh, of asthma. Uh, when you look at the places that are both uh, high in incidence and low in incidence, yeah. what are some of the positive and negative uh, other factors that kind of correlate with the level of asthma? Yeah. So. In Chicago, when we mapped out Chicago by right. neighborhoods, we found rates as low as less than 1% to as high as 44%. And, um, by neighborhood? By neighborhood. And although uh, it ranged, you know, but you could find neighborhoods that were similar economically and racially that had significantly different asthma rates. So then you really have to focus in on what are the environmental contributors. And a lot of that has been talked about today, but it's really significant. So the air pollution, the factories in terms of outdoor uh, pollutants, and then indoor pollutants, you know, the indoor air quality, which, which has been touched on today, significantly determine the rates of asthma. So we can't just overall say this is the asthma rate for this population. It really varies by neighborhood. So as you look by neighborhood, is the asthma rate essentially a proxy for less opportunity and more poverty? Is that simply it? Or is it more complicated than that? It's much more complicated. It is more complicated. Yes. I mean, that plays a role, no doubt. And the more resources, uh, access to care, health care, uh, the, the resource in, in, ta in terms of like parks and you know, advocates in the community mm -hmm. to actually clean up the neighborhood, it's very significant. Um, we actually went into schools to try to get students to advocate uh, for their neighborhoods and to help uh, be empowered to make change happen. We'll talk about that more in yeah. a minute, but let me just follow up. Yeah. So are there places of comparable income levels yes. that have very different rates? Yes. Absolutely, and I think that was the biggest point we wanted to make with the study, is you can go look at two neighborhoods very similar in terms of income and race with significantly different rates. So we need to figure out what it is in the neighborhood that's causing that variation in rate, and then we need to target our interventions to those specific factors. So, Kim, you, you've seen this, you know, up close and on these questions of unique factors mm -hmm. to a neighborhood. And in many ways, you had a kind of uh, white whale level mm -hmm. uh, extended struggle over one very big issue. A, a Harvard study found that two coal fire power, uh, MIT, uh, Harvard study, yes, mm -hmm. uh, found that two coal fire power plants had been responsible for 2,800 asthma attacks every year. That was in 2002. Correct. But it wasn't until another decade that the plants were shut down. Talk about what it took to shut them down and what ultimately was the tipping point that led to them being closed. You know, it's interesting because um, as great as the research is and as great as the stats are, that's not always what you need. And for 10 years, we had that, public, uh, that Harvard School of Public Health study and it didn't make a difference. The 40 people a year dying in our neighborhood was not enough to have a conversation around clean up or shut down. And so I think it's a combination of both the research, but also communities having to fight, having to fight city hall, having to fight politics, and really engaging in this conversation that it's not jobs versus the environment, it's jobs and the environment. You know, as a community, we had um, a coal power plant, yet nobody in our neighborhood worked there. 
we didn't have the economic benefit from it, but we sure in heck got all the pollution from it. And I will say that they're not the only ones. We shut down the two in Chicago. Mm -hmm. There's still one up in Waukegan. Their neighborhood is still dealing with that coal power plant. And so for us as a city, it's really about identifying in the communities what's happening and how is that not just impacting us as a city, but us as the Midwest as well. Um, who ultimately controlled the decision? Uh, for all these years on whether it was open or closed? Ultimately the company, the owner, um, but I think the reality is in the change administration, um, having a mayor who uh, cared about the issue and was willing to be proactive on the issue made a world of Change of local administration, change yes. from Mayor Daley to Mayor Correct. Man, Correct. Manu, because that, Mayor that Daley, was, yeah, go ahead. Mayor Daley hadn't done anything. Our, we had three ordinances that sat in City Hall and never moved. They sat there for years. Um, not to say that Mayor Emanuel is perfect mm -hmm. in any capacity, but um, I will say <laughs> um, that at the very least, he picked up the phone and made a phone call. That was more than Daly had done. And, w and that, was, that, was, that was it? That was it. He made a phone call and said, you either have two choices. You clean up or you shut down. And so what, 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 is, what is the status of the plants now? They're, they're shut they're down? They're shut down. Correct, they are shut down. And currently we're working um, as a community to figure out how do you go from a space of injustice to a space of justice in our neighborhood. And that's not another company. It's not another fossil fuel plant. It's an asset that helps build our neighborhood, employ our neighborhood, potentially in the green energy field. We're not sure yet. Mm -hmm. um, but we really want to ensure that that's a space of justice um, and not a casino, not something that our neighborhood does not need. You know, Richie, I, I don't know if your data answers this, but I was wondering as I was reading through your study, are the gaps between neighborhoods in terms of asthma yeah. incidents, are they getting bigger or smaller or over time? Is, it, is, is the disparity widening or narrowing? That's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer for that. but. I, I would say in some neighborhoods, you like Little Village, where there's high advocates and, and hard work being done to control environmental pollutants, you will see a decrease. And then other neighborhoods who don't have that kind of empowered voice, you may see an increase. So I think it's just going to fluctuate. And it really depends um, neighborhood by neighborhood. It depends on the politics of the time. It, there's so many factors that play into it. But the, the basic racial disparities and income disparities that we see, yeah they will either remain the same or, or grow, I would say. Over apparently. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talked about empowering communities. One place where you put a lot of your effort in that is the schools. Right. Talk about why focus on the schools, first of all, yeah. and what students can achieve. I mean, is this something, it, can individuals significantly mitigate their own risk yeah. through their own behaviors? Absolutely. They can. And, that is, I think, one of the biggest messages we have is every individual can have an impact. And so originally, you know, we're sitting in our offices and looking at data, just data and mapping out communities in Chicago. And then it was time to actually get into the communities and actually ask what's going on. So we started going to schools with high, high rates of asthma that we noticed on our map and, and empowering the students to tell us they became the researchers. And it's their voice telling us what are factors in your neighborhood that are contributing to the high rates we see. And what is it with a group of students with asthma that's causing you to have frequent exacerbations and hospitalizations and missed school days? And it was, it was really fascinating. All three, three of the schools we went into had very different different answers. Uh, one, it was all about outdoor air pollution. So it was the, the trucks going through, the idling trucks, the, the factories down the street. Um, and so their intervention was really to try to control that. The other one, it was all indoor air pollution. It was about the mold in their school and it was about the garbage and the cockroaches running through the halls. Mm. Um, and so that was their intervention. In another school, it was all about the, the violence and stress um, on the streets. So each group of students was able to identify different factors that were pertinent to their specific neighborhood. And, and I think that's the only way we're going to do it. If you get in and you can empower students to be a voice, we can go in and we're going to leave, you know, but they're going to stay there and make an impact and make a difference. You're nodding. What, 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 in your community, where do you, to what extent do people, do people feel that, you know, their own actions? Oh, absolutely. I think and that, um, so for us and our organization, we are intergenerational. So we work with grandparents all the way through little, little ones, but it's our young people in the neighborhood who really took the baton, both in fighting for the closure of the coal power plant, in fighting 20 years for a new park in our neighborhood, in fighting for the bus line. It is our young people who fully understand the connections between all three of those schools, mm -hmm. the violence in the streets, um, the conditions of our schools, and the conditions of the outdoor air quality that impact them on a daily basis. You, know, you mentioned the park, mm -hmm. first park. On your website, 
website, it says, and this was a former Superfund site, yes. correct? And it said that this was the first park to be built in Little Village in 75 years? Yeah, and we are the youngest neighborhood in the city of Chicago. How can, how, uh, it, talk a little bit about, I mean, that, that is a you know, pretty remarkable statistic. What does, what does access to green space, each of you, I mean, we start with Kim with you. Absolutely. What does access to green, green space mean in terms of uh, these kinds of issues? It means a world of difference, particularly if the community that is advocating for the green space is the one designing it. So let me be clear, this yeah. wasn't about advocating for a park and getting a design that was dropped on us. This was about spending 15 years with our neighborhood, surveying, questioning, workshops to find out what were the resources that were needed and then demanding that that park meet those resources. Um, I'm happy to say that in two years, our park has not had one violent incident that it's been open. And I think for a city of Chicago park, that says a lot um, because there's true ownership. So yes, it's great that folks can recreate and get health and get their hearts elevated, but it's also a, a space um, for stress relievers. And I should also say that right next door to our park is Cook County Jail. Home, of, home to 96 acres in our neighborhood, yet our park is only 23 acres, which in our neighborhood, 54 acres are dedicated to open space and 96 are dedicated to the incarceration of our people. I think that really speaks to a question of how land is being used, who's deciding about our land uses, and how those decisions are being made with and without community. Uh, when you looked at when you yeah. looked at the factors, yeah. uh, did green? How, where did green space figure in? It was very important. It it's is always very important. In fact, we took a group of students from kind of the north side, Lincoln Park, Chicago, yesterday to mm -hmm. Englewood uh, to put on a health fair, and really for them to understand what the health conditions are of this neighborhood that's close by, but but a different makeup. And one of the biggest things kids and families said in Englewood was the same. Same thing, we don't exercise because we don't go outside because there's not enough green space, there's not, and there's a lot of violence. So the whole idea of having park green space, places where people can get fresh air, hopefully clean fresh okay. air, um, and also you know, get that exercise that's so vital to health overall is, is critical. And when we looked at it by neighborhood, that was a factor, just neighborhood amenities in general played a big role in in rates of um, asthma prevalence. So we've been talking, interestingly, you know, our conversation is really focused on local policy, local choices, even, you know, at the level of the individual. But when we started the day, we were talking a lot about the Environmental Protection, mm -hmm. right, uh, the EPA. Um, it took a long time to lift up the issue of environmental justice within the EPA, and we still struggle to this day. But a lot has been done and a lot has been completed. So for instance, um, the Superfund site that was the park, for yeah. many years we spent, um, actually fighting the EPA. We spent many, um, it took a long time to lift up the issue of environmental justice within the EPA and we still struggle to this day. But a lot has been done and a lot has been completed. So for instance, um, the Superfund site that was the park, yeah. for many years we spent um, actually fighting the EPA. We spent many years during that Superfund cleanup demanding that the cleanup was more stringent, demanding that um, the testing was much um, deeper than they really wanted to go. And this came from a space of folks assuming that as a community of color, a community of immigrants, that we didn't understand science, that we didn't understand parts per million, that we didn't understand remediation processes. And the reality is, is we fully understood them. And when we saw what they were trying to do, we said, that's not good enough for our neighborhood. We want better cleanup standards. And so we've, we've, we've gone round and round with the EPA, but I will say that they are very important. And I think anything, any dismantling of the EPA is only gonna hurt our communities more than it's gonna help our communities or even our economy for that matter. Yeah. Um, but it's not a perfect relationship. It definitely yeah. has a long way to go, but we do, we do appreciate and see the, the benefits of all the regulations they have put out in our communities over the years. What's the role of federal regulation in terms of <laughs> controlling the risk. I agree. I mean, I think it's it's really important. I mean, if we do not have the ability to understand what the risks are and to control it yeah. and to have um, federal agencies and local agencies, you know, funded well enough to make that happen. I mean, the air we breathe, the most important thing for mm -hmm. all of us. And uh, the more you decrease funding or, or you know, demantelize that is going to really impact everything. And I think the other part of it is, is the research, because I think what we've seen here with mm -hmm. Kim and I is that having that research that actually helps advocate for new policies is really critical, and that's also being cut. Um, so it's, it's so important to have this uh, academic community collaborations, but 
the research is really what's going to identify factors that and, are important. And there are, there are many, I mean, the EPA does have grants for grassroots mm -hmm. groups, yeah. and I believe you've received, yes. what, 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 what did they fund you to do, and what do you think it will mean if that funding is withdrawn, not only for you, sure. but more broadly for community so groups? So we were very fortunate we were able to get funding to do um, community research. Yeah. Uh, they call it citizen science, we call it community science, mm -hmm. um, but it's really about empowering community members to be able to take portable air monitors and stationary air monitors and walk around the neighborhood to understand what's the particulate matter count in our neighborhood, what's the NO count Ooh. in our neighborhood, and this stems from a concern around uh, diesel truck pollution. Chicago sees 30% of all goods coming through its um, city, um, and all of that is either on rail or on truck. We don't have a port or a port at least within the Chicago proper area. And so there's a lot of concern around how the influx of diesel in our community is impacting us. And so folks for the next two years will be doing air monitoring and we will be making those results public to the community to figure out what is the policy change or advocacy that they'd like to see happen. And that was funded through EPA That was support. funded through EPA. Um, if we don't get the funding, we will continue with the project. We already have the air monitors, so they can't take them back. Mm. Um, <laughs> Um, and unless they come to my office and grab them out of me. Um, so we, can, we'll, we plan on continuing to do the project one way or another with or without funding. S speaking of grabbing, um, uh, <laughs> uh, term. I, um, not going where you think I'm going. Nope. But, um, <laughs> speaking of grabbing, uh, there's a, there's a, I, I, this isn't directly on point, but it is relevant for a group like yours working in a primarily Mexican-American mm -hmm. community uh, you know, we have seen very different rhetoric from the Attorney General about immigration mm -hmm. enforcement. We have seen the first DACA mm -hmm. recipient uh, uh, deported. Um, what, what is the, I mean, you, even on issues unrelated, like seemingly unrelated, like environmental uh, concerns. What is the impact of all of this on your ability to mobilize and organize your community? I mean, I think what it does is it brings to light an, a layer that has always been there, but that I think the general public doesn't know about, which is the question of immigration status, right? I think folks are very concerned about the fact that if they go out in public, if they protest, if they stand up for something, is immigration, is ICE going to be there? Is the Chicago, and we know for a fact Chicago Police Department, as much as they say they're not working with ICE, they are working with ICE, right? And so community members are very concerned about their safety and well-being if they even come out to participate. But like I said, this is this is the reality of our communities in general. And so I think what this what 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 everything that's happening has done is kind of lifted that layer back for people to see that if you have the privilege to go to a march and not worry about being detained, that's great. But for a lot of our community members, that's not a privilege that they have. They have to worry about, are they gonna get home to their children? Are their children gonna make it home, right? There's an extra layer of what happens um, when we take ourselves out into the street. And, and that's not to say that folks aren't willing to do it, but there's definitely a, a greater, le a greater um, layer of uh, insecurity. And so part of the work that we do now is not just talk about air quality, but we spend a fourth to half of our meetings talking about what are your rights? What are the immigration services that folks can provide? Um, how can folks get involved? How can folks protect themselves? Because we recognize that you cannot separate environment from immigration. They go hand in hand, mm. and particularly in a community like ours where we are such a young community and we can't get we can't get legalized in this country, yet our children can go fight for this country. Yet we can get ticketed for being on the street, yet we get demanded to pay our taxes, yet we can't get immigration status in this country. And so I think it just brings up the intersection and the, um, between immigration and environmental justice and between all other movements as well. Uh, I want to bring in the audience in a moment, but Bruce, let me ask you one last thing. Yeah. The environmental movement itself. Yes. And there have all, you know, I've, I've written about environmental issues since the, uh, since the Reagan administration, and there's always been this kind of tension, this question about whether it is sufficiently concerned about environmental justice issues, mm -hmm. more worried about you know, parks and pandas. Um, uh, is, there, is, there, is there sufficient focus on these questions of uh, inequality and uh, unequal exposure to some of these threats, or is it something that the environmental movement itself needs to be more attentive to? Well, the environment, you know, as we talk about, especially for health, health issues, specifically asthma uh, today, but environment plays such a large role, you know, along with genetics. There's so many things mm. that the environment is the primary role in terms of whether or not the condition exists or how bad it is or how much it affects someone's lives. So, and the disparities in it are, are huge. And I, I I think there's a lot of amazing researchers all over the country doing a ton of work on really addressing that, uh, both from a genetic and an environmental standpoint, but there definitely needs to be more. I mean, I think that's something that gets missed a lot. And 
places like the EPA, you know, the RHA, the Respiratory Health Association gave us our first grant mm -hmm. to start this research. So if it's not the NIH necessarily, the, the grassroots, the local people who are, are um, invested in this and invested in. Did you have allies in your yeah. fight? Did you feel like, you know, the broader environmental movement was engaged as you were in this long struggle? It took three tries, but we got there, yeah. yeah. I'm not gonna lie, it took three tries, and I think the reality is there is a disparity, but we're working on, on closing that gap. Yeah. And just to let you know, environmental justice organizations overall receive less than, I think it's 2% of all environmental funding, yet we get the biggest gains with that 2%. Let's bring in the audience for a couple questions. We got Oy. microphones. Uh, Jay Peters from the Health Science Center. We were fortunate enough to get the Chess Foundation to give us a humanitarian award to go into the 10 schools that had the highest rates of asthma mm -hmm. and absentee. And we found out that by educating the teachers, the gym teachers, and especially the environmental engineers, mm -hmm. that the rate of absenteeism fell dramatically. And I was wondering how do you, or how would you suggest that we get the school boards and the city involved in really educating the people to also be advocates for the students. Okay. That's fabulous, that's great work, and I think that's stuff that really needs to be promoted and published and advocated for. I mean, if you've already developed something, some kind of a toolkit for schools, that would be easy to translate into any schools, you know, as long as it gets the attention it deserves. Would you? My name is Susan Mudd. I'm with the Environmental Law and Policy Center here in Chicago. Um, my question relates also to schools and children. Mm -hmm. um, four and a half million children in the Midwest ride diesel school buses every day mm -hmm. to and from school. We know that diesel pollution is an exacerbator of asthma, at the least, as well as other things. And I'm wondering what you all think about that and what you think about the opportunity now provided by the VW Defeat Device Settlement to clean up school buses in our country by converting to electric school buses. It's an opportunity that, for instance, here in Illinois, there's going to be $108 million available to the state to clean up diesel mm. equipment. Wow. School buses are one of the options. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think f in our neighborhood we don't have a lot of school buses, but I think it's a great initiative. I think that this is where kind of figuring out what the priority in each neighborhood is around kind of where the sources are. So like in Little Village, because we don't have that many school buses, it might not be the best, but we're definitely looking at the um, heavy diesel trucks that are coming through with goods, right? So figuring out how else to use that funding aside from school buses to also possibly convert um, the heavy diesel vehicles that we have. I think um, our last study showed we had one point uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 1.3 buses coming through our neighborhood um, every 10 seconds, um, give or take. Wow. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. City, city and That's school buses, I, I, thanks for bringing that up. I really appreciate it because I think it is, is very, very important. And one of our schools definitely just harped on that so much that that was a big, big issue, the diesel buses and the diesel trucks yeah. that come through the neighborhood. So I think that would be a, a great effort and excited to see it happen. So uh, I want to, uh, one broader question before, before, we, uh, before we let you guys go, which is not specific to the, the, uh, the, the, the debate that we've been talking about for the last 25 minutes. You're in an area where progress comes very slow often. I mean, you, you, know, you spent 10 years on that, on, on, that, on that coal plant. You have tracked these, you know, these challenges for many years. We are in an instant gratification world. As a pers on a personal level, what does it take to sustain this kind of effort, to have, the, in effect, civic stamina to continue pushing this rock year after year? What, what does it take? Well, um, I think it takes patience, um, hum humility, um, and just understanding that we're in this for the long haul. That, um, you know, when people said to us, well, you should move if you don't like it, we were like, no, I'm not moving. You know, this is our neighborhood, this is our city. Why should I have to leave? Why should I have to move? And so I think it's that fighting spirit um, that comes from our people, that comes from our culture, that comes from our moms, um, that keeps us going. You know, I'm a very strong Chicana woman that comes from the southwest mm. side of Chicago, and I hold true to my roots. I hold true to what my grandmother and my mother fought and my aunts fought for. And so I, I take the women that I work with and the women in my neighborhood, and I channel that energy to get up every morning and do what I love to do, which is kick butt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I can say. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, I second everything you said. I mean, I'm a pediatrician. I'm in public health. I mean, this is our mission. This is our vision. And, you know, our team here, they're all in it to make a difference and improve the health and lives of children. That's our motto, and that's what we're here to do. And even if we go into one school and see it happen for just a couple kids or a couple, it's, that's the instant gratification you get. And you hope you can scale that up. And you hope the research that you put out there can empower communities to move it forward. And we've seen change happen. And I think that's what, what really keeps us going. All right, Kim Ruchi, thank you so much for joining us. Join me in thanking this terrific panel.